man, this has been a really revealing study. I was just talking to some friends. Um, the power of knowing that when somebody curses you for following Torah, they actually don't have any power to do any harm to you. It's the same whether they're an actual witch and actually conjuring up something or just a misguided Christian placing curses on you and asking who bewitched you because you're sticking to follow the Father's ways. As long as you're following the Father's ways, their words have no power over you because you, like the Father, you want to see his Torah elevated. You want to see his ways thought by all the people. I mean, imagine if we were actually following these ways and we weren't allowing banks to charge usury over people, which is bondage. If we weren't keeping people indebted for more than seven years, and every seven years we had a jubilee, a release of debt, the world would be such a better place where we would embrace the strangers coming across the border not the government necessarily, but we as a people would say, come, ye that are heavy laden and burdened, just like the Messiah says. But instead, we, we cut people off at the knees and we curse them and revile them. This is what we see Paul do. I hadn't originally gone to this point in my study, but I might, if Jehovah wills. So, where we left off was with the Nazarite vow. And showing that Paul was keeping Torah. So what could possibly, let me say, what could Paul possibly do to prove he wasn't against Torah? Make sure he was kept so feast after the ascension of the Messiah. In fact, years later, they were still attending temple services, performing all the things of the Torah as commanded by Moses. Acts 26, and then they sailed after the Days of Unleavened Bread. This is the Feast of Passover. Why mention it in Acts if it didn't mean something? From Philippi and came unto them to Troa in five days, where we abode seven days. This is the Passover, the Unleavened Bread. And even to the Corinthians, and Torah teachers use this, he commands them to keep the feast. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, purge out there, therefore the old leaven, that may, you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. And you see, this completely destroys the idea that Paul was teaching. Because they are shadows, you don't do them. He's saying, no, Christ is our Passover, therefore let us keep it. And it's not for this reason that I reject Paul. You see, uh, as Paul says, a little leaven leavens a little whole lump. And Paul has got more than a little leaven. His teaching against circumcision, so clearly against it, is absolutely dangerous. And not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let us keep the feast. Paul, even though he was a man of sin, the great delusion still taught you you should keep the feast. This is why I had so much trouble shaking Paul off of my tree of righteousness. Why can I say he is against Yah and his Torah when he's telling me to guard the feasts? He himself kept the Sabbath, the days of unleavened bread. He was in the middle of his Nazarite vow and wanted to get to Jerusalem. Acts 20.16, for Paul decided to sail past Ephesus that there may not be a loss of time in Asia. This is, again, the second time we see Paul avoiding Asia, and this is prophetic. Look at the seven churches of Asia that God was trying to protect from this man. If it were possible for him on the day of Pentecost, the 50 days, to be at Jerusalem, and Pentecost is one of the feasts of we see in Leviticus 23. It's declared there, and Paul seems dedicated to keeping it in Jerusalem. Leviticus 23, 15 to 19. He have numbered to you from the morrow of the Sabbath, from the day of your bringing the sheaf, 
of the wave offering, they are seven perfect Sabbaths. And on the morrow of the seventh Sabbath, you do number 50 days or Pentecost. And you have brought near a new present to Jehovah. Out of your dwellings, you bring a bread of wave offering, two loaves, two tenth deals of flour. They are yeast, they are baked, the first fruits, and you have brought near besides the bread, the seven lambs. And see, this would have happened. In Jerusalem, they would have brought forth the lambs to sacrifice after the resurrection, both those who believe in Messiah and the Hebrews that didn't. And Paul was among the, one of the Hebrews that did believe. And what did he do? He said, I need to go and celebrate Pentecost in the temple. I need to make sure that I'm making these sacrifice offerings. Perfect ones, sons of a year, and one of a bullock, a son of a herd, and two rams, they are burnt offering to Jehovah with their present and their libations, a fire of sweet fragrance to Jehovah. And he prepared one of a kind kid of goats for a sin offering. He would have made a sin offering. This is why it's so important to understand what's going on in Acts and the rest of Scripture. Acts, I do believe, is a book of history. Inspired? I'm still judging that, but it's showing us that in this book, Paul was keeping Torah. And I do believe, like myself, this is why so many people have a hard time shaking Paul off their tree of righteousness. I did. Look at It's clear he was keeping Torah in the book of Acts. There are also some other things in Acts that reveal just who Paul was. We can't discount his words in his epistles that so directly condemn Torah. Like, I, I don't remember if I go through them or not. I might pull them up. Oh, here we go. For there's no evidence that the early believers stopped performing any of Torah because of Messiah. Not even Paul, the Christian liar, who's used to defend lawlessness, and it is what he teaches, actually guards all the commandments with that in Acts. And this is where the double minus of Christianity comes in. Because if you read Acts with the mindset that nothing changed, which is what Messiah taught, you see that both Peter, Paul, and all the others, they keep these things repeatedly, the weekly Sabbath, the seven yearly feasts. They're keeping them. They're guarding them. They're even doing sin offerings still. Yes, he would have been brought that sin offering to the temple during Pentecost that, to keep the Torah, what happens in Jerusalem. And again, believers, likely in Messiah, and those who don't believe, these are Hebrews, challenge Paul on his teachings. They're performing the Deuteronomy 13 test on Paul here. Acts 21, 19 to 21 and having saluted them, he was declaring one by one each of these things God did among the nations through his administration. And they have heard, they were glorifying the Lord. And they also said to him, Thou seest, brother, how many myriads there are of Jews who have believed and are zealous of the law. And they have instructed concerning thee the apostasy from Moses. Thou dost teach to all the Jews among the nations, saying, not to circumcise the children, nor to walk after the customs. Until last September, I believed this was a false accusation. And when Christians side with the accusation saying, yes, Paul taught against the circumcision. He taught against the Torah. He taught these are types and shadows and that Gentiles don't need to do them. When they side with that, you're giving Paul a sentence of death. You're placing Paul himself under the curse. Until last September, I truly did believe this was a false accusation, that Paul was teaching people to circumcise their children. If he wasn't, he would go against Yah or his Torah. Then the scales of Paul fell from my eyes. And Galatians is so clear on this. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith working through love. And I agree, you should start with the love of Jehovah. That's how what Yeshua says to guard the first and greatest commandment, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, the Shema. Love Yehovah with all of your heart, with all of your might, and with all of your being. But 
to say that circumcision is therefore nothing, uh, this is again a logical fallacy. It's Jehovah that commands it. So if you have faith working through love, you'll get circumcised because you love Jehovah. And look at the next verse. And this is directly showing us that he did not preach circumcision. He preached against it. And if I, brethren, if I, uncircumcision, I yet preach, why yet am I persecuted? Then half the stumbling block of the cross had been done away. So he's saying, you see, I'm preaching the uncircumcision, and yet I'm being persecuted. Why is the stumbling block of the cross done away with? You see what I said earlier, how powerful these words are? The cross is not a stumbling block. The stumbling block was placed before someone to put them under the curse. Or that even they would cut themselves off who are unsettling you. And the language here is very direct. He's telling them to mutilate themselves for his gospel. Let's talk about that real quick. Uh, so Paul uses a specific term to cut themselves off. And look at what Deuteronomy 23 says. This is why I said that the words of Paul, if you follow through on them, that is how you place yourself under the curses of the law. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation, which is to cut off yourself, shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. So Paul is telling us, and let's read it again. In, I, even that they would cut themselves off who are unsettling you. So what are they, are they teaching? They're teaching circumcision. Now let's look at the next verse. It's even more condemning of Paul. Beware the dogs, the evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. And the context here is about the people teaching circumcision. He's calling them dogs, which is an unclean animal. He's calling them evil workers and mutilators. Remember, it's those that are mutilated that cannot enter the assembly of the Lord. So he's saying that those that obey Torah, they become circumcised. They are mutilators. They are keeping you first. But in fact, it's Paul's words where he's placing a stumbling stone in front of your eyes, in front of your ears, that he is placing you under the curse. If you follow through with what he says, this is how Satan works. Christ would never become a stumbling block for the, his chosen people. And this is not the correct interpretation of that prophecy. And neither is this the correct interpretation of Torah, that those who preach circumcision are dogs? God, how can anyone justify these words? It's completely anti-Semitic. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, an unclean animal. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, listen to his words. He's totally condemning circumcision. And we, let's go back and read Acts 21 again. And having saluted them, he was declaring one by one each of the things God did among the nations through his ministration. And they, having heard, were glorifying the Lord. And they also said to him, Thou seest, brother, how many myriads there are of Jews who have believed and are zealous of the law, and they are instructed concerning thee, the apostasy from Moses that thou dost teach to all the Jews among the nations, saying, Not to circumcise the children, nor after the customs to walk. Amen. And unfortunately, we just revealed that's exactly what Paul did. He condemns circumcision. He condemns the customs of Moses. He condemns Torah. And in doing so, he condemns Jehovah. He condemns those that obey Torah. He condemns those that turn back to Jehovah, calling them dogs, calling them evil workers, and calling them the mutilation. And you remember what the Proverbs warned, and I've shown this verse before, Romans 4, 5. 
and Proverbs 17, 15, where Paul condemns righteous works and exalts wickedness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And, the, and again, this, this is all about the works of circumcision, of obeying Torah. That if you obey Torah, you lose grace and gain debt. This is insane in God's economy. But to him who does not work, and he says it again, don't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. As we know, and I've, I've hammered this verse home many times, God does not justify the ungodly. That's Exodus 23, 7. His faith is accounted for righteousness. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. We can see, and we'll see this in the coming passage, the abomination that made desolate, Paul stood in the temple of God. <clears throat> 